How many of you glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Hallelujah. How many of you glad to be in the house of the Lord? This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice this morning and be glad there. Hallelujah. Come on, let's open up this service with praise. Enter his gates with thanksgiving into his porch with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Hallelujah, Jesus, we worship you.
hears us because we have needs. Amen? Amen. Uh, I have a lot of wants. Yeah. I'd like God to turn back the time and then have a little bit of this up here, but it doesn't happen. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'd like to go back in time because I want to change a few things, but I just have to live with my past and keep moving forward. Amen? Yes. Amen. Yes. Praise God because there are people who have needs. Amen. And I'm one of those, and I'm sure you are too, Lord. Amen. Praise God. Oh, so this morning we're going to take a few to, to the Lord in prayer. I will remember Sister Lane. Uh, she, I guess she's sick this morning, the way it sounds. And we want to remember also Linda Price as well, and David also. We want to keep them in our prayers due to sickness. I wish you to uh, pray for my dad. My dad's in St. Joseph this morning. I just have some complications. And uh, we're going to keep them in our prayers if you would. And I'm sure there's many other needs in this place. Amen. By the living and raising of the hands. Oh, yes. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're going to ask the ushers to come, but we're going to go to the Lord in prayer first. Hallelujah. How many believes God can do anything? How many is expecting a miracle in your life? How many know there's nothing too hard for the Lord? Not to be in his presence and God reaching down and touching the body. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. We do have authority, Brother Reese. Hallelujah. We got authority this morning because we claim the blood of Christ over every circumstance and situation. Hallelujah. Praise God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Lord, we ask God that you would continue to keep us in mind, Lord, as we ask. As we petition heaven, Lord, that you would continue to help us forth through every time of trial, every time of need, God. We're asking, Lord, every circumstance, every situation is at a hand. Lord, we plead the blood, God, that we refuse to believe that there is defeat in our lives, God, because we know you hold tomorrow. Lord, we ask, God, that you would touch these prayer requests, Lord, both spoken and unspoken a lot. Hallelujah. We declare in victory. Amen. Hallelujah. We know there's proof and there's victory in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. We're asking God that you would continue to cut, touch Sister Lane, Lord, Sister Price, David Price, my dad, God, and many others, Lord, in this place this morning. But we're asking God that you continue to keep your hands on your people which are called by your precious name, Lord. We're thanking you for it all, God, in the mighty name of Jesus Christ, that you'll do your perfect will in their lives. And somebody shout out to the Lord with a voice of triumph once again. Lift your voice and clap your hands to the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 It's good to have brothers Grace here this morning and family. Hallelujah. And I'm sure he's got a perfect word of God to bring to us and lift our spirits and souls this morning. Praise God. But we're going to remember uh, all those who are not here. Why don't you just turn and shake somebody's hand and tell me you look mighty nice this morning. You're looking good right now. You're looking good. I'm going to ask, Lord, that you would touch this offering and these tithes and offerings that we have to give, Lord, that you would take what we have and multiply it for the kingdom of God in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Your passing place and worship in them if you will. Amen? One more time, clap your hands to the Lord.
your family. My Lord, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, just for a few moments longer. I ain't worried about my little sermon. I want God to have his way right now. I'm going to say what I feel God put on my heart to speak. And right now, I just want you to entertain the presence of the Lord because you might be preparing your mind right now to hear what he's about to tell you. You might not be ready to receive what he's about to tell you. Amen. That's okay, husband. Yeah. That's all right. Amen. 
Okay, that's all right. As long as she tells you when you do good every now and then, it's okay. <laughs> Inside joke. Amen. Second Kings 7 and 3. It's more I am thankful. <clears throat> and there were four leprous men at the entering end of the gate. And they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? Amen. Why do we sit here until we die? Four men that literally had nothing to live for, cast outs, nobodies, said, why are we sitting here until we die? This morning I want to talk about when your desperation determines your destination. When you get desperate, that will determine what direction you're going to go in. Amen. When you get complacent, that'll determine what destination you stay in. Amen. When you get comfortable, that will determine what you allow in your spirit. Amen. But when your desperation gets stirred up in you, that will absolutely determine the destination in which you're headed. Right now, I want you to lift your hands to the Lord. And I want you to pray and ask God to bless you right now to hear what thus saith the word of the Lord. To open your minds and read to the preaching and the speaking of the word of the Lord. Lord, we love you today, God. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Lord, in this place in the word of God, we thank you for your word. Thank you for your presence, for your authority. Thank you for your word in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. amen. We're thankful for the word of the Lord. Why don't you clap your hands before we see you. There was a revivalist that was uh, uh, going on in a little old tent out in the backwoods somewhere. And this evangelist got up on the platform and began to have a healing service and praying for everybody all over the place, laying hands and just doing his thing, man. He was rolling his left and right, calisthenic. He was just massaging shoulders, slobber falling outside his mouth, rolling on the ground, you know, Pentecost. And he was doing it while he was praying. And this man walked up to him and said, I want to pray for my hearing and before he could get any more information, that evangelist slapped his hand on the side of that man's head and went to going at it. God, heal his here. Touch him, God, in Jesus' name. Heal it. He got through. He leaned down to him and said, how's your healing? How's your hearing? He said, I don't know yet. It's not till Tuesday of next week. They weren't on the same page. You see what I'm saying? He had a court hearing coming up. He said, I ain't sure about it yet. See, sometimes we've got to be on the same page if we're going to receive what God has for us. And sometimes we need to understand what we need in our spirit to get desperate about a walk with God and a work with God and a prayer life with God. Sometimes we just kind of get complacent and we've all been guilty of it where church becomes just a Sunday thing and Wednesday or whatever the midweek service night is becomes just another time to come to church and make sure we got our check on the board that we were here and we were counted in attendance and if we looked good and we were all accounted for and, and everything and sometimes we're just not on the same page for what God has for us. But this story right here kind of stirred me up when I first heard this. I, has anybody ever had somebody come up to you and say, man, you need to try something different. You need to just try something. Whether it be food or whether it be some kind of uh, exciting thing or whatever. My, my pastor, Brother Patterson, Brother Michael Patterson there in Congress, he, he has for years tried to convince me that I need to jump out of the plane with him to help raise money for She's the Crux. <laughs> that is funny. That is very funny. Because it's easier for me just to write a check. Amen. Plane ain't got a crash for me to write a check to get money. And right. see, I don't like heights. See, and he calls me and talks to me all the time. Hey, brother, British man, we're gonna be jumping out of plane again. I don't know if they still do it now. We're several years back, he'll be jumping out of planes, raising money, and then he'll do it just for fun, just for kicks. I believe Jordan jumps out of planes, don't he? Does he do silly stuff like that? I don't know if he does it. I bet he would if you asked him how it would. But I tell you right now, he has asked me for years to jump out of a plane with him. And I'm thinking to myself, there's no need to jump out of a plane that isn't crashing. Amen. There's no need to move out of something that is doing perfectly fine. Right. There's no need to get out of something that's working. Amen. 
So it doesn't matter if it's something different or not. That doesn't impress me to do something different if it doesn't work for me. All right. And in the scripture we read here in 2 Kings, I want to give you a little bit of a backstory about these leprous men that had determined at some point that they had gotten fed up with just sitting there dying in one spot that they had always been. All right. See, the Syrians were in the middle of a war with Israel. And they had come to the city of Samaria to lay siege to it. And it wasn't long before all the resources within the city were running out and the people were beginning to starve. Yes, sir. A lot going on. Now food was getting scarce. The desperation was so great that the people actually were forced into cannibalism just to stay alive. Amen. You think it's hard when bread comes off the shelves every time Savannah hears about a flurry coming through. Bacon, Georgia does that too. Amen. We get upset when we can't get our loaf of bread and our milk, which for whatever reason, that's what you survive on in the snowstorm. I have no idea why, but it works. <laughs> and everybody wants to survive on milk and bread, but hey, it goes. And you think you got problems in those issues, but these here had food that was so scarce because of this battle that cannibalism began to set in. God's man, the prophet at this time, of this horrendous situation in history was Elisha. Amen. Now Elisha also was within the city, sitting in his house with the elders. Amen. The king blamed God and began to get mad at God and Elisha Amen. for what was happening. And isn't that something how whenever bad things happen, it's, it's always men's, uh, preachers' faults, evangelists' Amen. faults, missionaries' Amen. faults, pastors' faults, and things of that sort. And, Sometimes the heat kind of goes in that area because, well, we're standing in the place for the voice of God, and sometimes it can seem that way. And that's kind of what had taken place. This king was now wroth and mad at God and Elisha. But before the messenger, see, and he sent a messenger to go kill Elisha, take his head off, maybe hoping this would relieve this famine. But before the messenger got to the door, Elisha, the man of God, heard from the Lord. And Elisha told the elders that he was on his way with the king in hot pursuit. And instead of detaining Elisha, the elders that were with Elisha went and detained the messenger that the king had sent instead. Amen. And out of impatience with God, the king's response was this. Surely this calamity is from the Lord. And why should I wait for the Lord? any longer. Anybody ever felt like that before? You pray, you pray, you pray. And it just seems like, Lord, why have you not answered yet? And that king had gotten to this point. Surely this calamity is God's fault. And why should I wait for the Lord any longer? And this is where we go and we pick up on the scene this morning of what I read in Scripture in Kings 7, 1 through 20. Then Elijah spoke up and said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then the Lord on whose hand that the king leaned on, and, and who the king depended on as a voice in his ear, leaned over and answered that man of God, and he spoke and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, in my terms, Oh, it's going to happen. But guess what? You're not going to take part in it. He said, Behold, thou shalt see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat thereof of the food in this famine. Verse 3 says, And now there were four leprous men. I love how the scene just begins to move and jump from this. You're going to see it, but you ain't going to take part in it. Boom, the scene cuts over here to another clip. Now all of a sudden, we're notified that there are four lepers sitting at the entering of the gate. Amen. And they said one to another, Why sit we here till we die? Amen. If we say we will enter to the city, and then the famine is in the city, then we'll just die there. And if we sit still here, well, we're going to die here also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they shall save us alive, then we'll live. And if they kill us, Basically, we were going to die anyway. In other words, we're in a lose-lose situation. We have nothing but, even if it's a portion of things to gain here at all. If we die, 
We were already going to die. We're leprous men. Amen. We go into the city. Either we'll die here from leprosy, bleeding out, infection, or we'll die here from starvation. Yes, or we can be slaves. Mm. Or they can kill us. Mm. The only upside to all this they had was hoping they would be brought into slavery. They had come to the conclusion that they had absolutely nothing to lose. Amen. Anybody ever been there this morning? Amen. That moment that you come to where you say to yourself that I need, what I need is more valuable than what I presently have. Amen. I must do whatever it takes to obtain it. That moment that an alcoholic actually says my future with my family means more than this present body. When that man says my marriage is more than this horrible addiction. Amen. It's when that soul says my salvation is more than this lifestyle of sin. Yes, sir. We've all been there in those cases. I don't know where you were the moment you received the Holy Ghost, but I know where I was. I know what addictions I had in my life as I stood on that side yes, of the church. Sir. I know what drugs were in my system. I know what I battled with. I don't know what you battled with. But at some point, before I come to church that night, I was sitting in a room with a bunch of my friends. And I didn't know anything about God, heaven, hell, nothing, salvation, nothing. I was completely just without fruit. I had no roots. I had nothing. And I was sitting there living in sin and living a lifestyle of sin. And one of my friends come over there to me and, and just said to me, just joking, he said, man, you know you're going to go to hell living like this, don't you? Just joking. We were all sitting around drinking that and silk. You know you're going to go to hell living like this, don't you? I said, oh, man, I'll go to hell for a glass of ice for it. How we make jokes like that. And I dismissed myself laughing and went back to the back of the mobile home, back to the bathroom, and sat there on that toilet, put the lid down, sat down there and weep like a baby in that bathroom. I had no nothing. I had no knowledge of nothing. But if that hell was real, it scared me to death. And I had no idea if it was even real or not. But in my mind, if it wasn't real, I ain't got nothing to lose. There ain't no hell. Do my thing. Yes, sir. But what if he's right? Mm. Ooh, that's what caused fear. Mm -hmm. What if he is right about this hell thing? And something in me turned and desperation began to move slightly, not, not drastically. I didn't run back in there in the group of my friends, fall down and say, God have mercy. I went back to doing what I did, kept on drinking, partying, doing my thing. But something stirred in me because right after that, someone approached me. And invited me to come to church. Amen. And in my back of my mind, there was that desperate comment again. What if hell is real? Yes, then I better get something in me that will change the course of my life. Yeah. Verse 5 says, Then the leprous men rose up in the twilight to go into the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was not a soul in the camp. No man was there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel has hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they rose and fled in the twilight, left their tents, their horses, their donkeys, even the camp as it was, and they fled for their lives. And when the leprous men came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink, and carried thence silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried the same thing and went and hid it. Somebody in this place understands. Desperation got a hold of them. They said, if we stay here, we're going to die. But if we go and move from where we are, there might be a slight change that I could actually lead them. And in the process of their moving from one spot to the other, every single step they made caused fear in the ears of the enemy. Come on, that ought to excite somebody right now. Every time you decide to walk with the Lord, go to church Make your way to a prayer meeting. Lift your hands and worship Him when you don't feel like it. Even when I don't see it, He's working. We sing about it, but it's hard even when I don't feel it, He's working. It's hard. 
But every step these lepers being made caused fear. Now the enemy had no idea what they were hearing. They thought other kings had risen up and gathered together to come to take everything they had and they just left that. Took off. There comes a time when we must have desperation and determination to do whatsoever it takes. Because your determination will definitely determine your destination this morning. But then something happened in their desperate moment. While they were gathering all these things, oh, such a beautiful moment in how somebody who is broken can still have a love and an appetite for other broken people. And these lepers men are gathering up all of these things. And verse 9 says, Then they said one to another, We do not well this day. Because this is a good day of times. If we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come and that we may go and tell the king's household. Skipping down to verse 18. And it came to pass as the man of God had spoken to the king saying, Two measures of barley. See, the man of God was speaking a prophecy that was happening that he had no idea the lepers were bringing all this to pass. Hallelujah. Over in this camp, they had everything that this city needed, and the lepers ran them out of the camp. And now the man of God hears the voice of the Lord and says, Oh, tomorrow, tomorrow, two measures of barley for a shekel and a measure of fine flour for a shekel. About this time in the gate of Samaria. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, if the Lord shall make windows of heaven, might such a thing be. And he said, Behold, you shall see it, that you shall not eat thereof. And so it fell out unto him, for the people trod upon him in the gate, and he died. As he stood in his gate, doubting what God could do, those that believed what God could do trampled him to death. I'm going to tell you right now, it's a scary moment to come to the house of God in the presence of a God that can heal, can touch, can bless and sit here and allow the person right next to you get what you've been waiting on. Now, I don't mind you get it. Don't get me wrong. I don't have a problem. I want everybody to. But for me to willingly stand in the gate and not take any steps for what God has me and then get bitter toward God because I ain't been touched but Sister so and so been touched. I ain't got my blessing, but Brother So-and-so got his blessing. And then we start getting bitter with God and getting bitter with Brother So-and-so and Sister -so So-and-so. Before you know it, we trotted at the gate of the church. Desolate. Nothing more than just remnants and leftovers from a battle that the enemy cast upon the church. Now all this happened because four measly, sickly, unpopular, hungry, lonely, broken, Unwanted. Have I talked about anybody in this place yet? Filthy lepers got desperate. Miracles will happen. Miracles will happen in church services when ex drug addicts and ex addicts and ex alcoholics begin to get desperate for what God can do. And when you begin to see other alcoholics stumbling through the doors of your church, you just grab them out. Sit them down beside them. Put your arm around them and just worship them. Show them the way. Something happened in a church, in a city, when desperate people begin to worship. Oh, come on, let's do that just for a moment. That sounds beautiful. Let's get desperate in our worship for a moment. And does nothing but cry and cry because the devil then took another child from her. And something happens when she moves from crying 
to an anger towards the enemy. I'm not talking about people. You know who the real enemy is. Right. Right. And she just says, why do I sit here till my spirit dies? Why do I sit here? I sit here, I die, my child dies in the world. If I sit here and backslide and go in the world, I die. My child dies in the world. But if I rise up and get aggressive in my prayer, if you reach my child to God, I shall bring them back to the Lord. Keep going. While your child is inside of a city star in the day. Get this. Church and I was just a little old young bucket, 20 years old. I thought I knew everything. 
And he sat me down and he began to talk to me. Where do you see yourself in five years? I don't know where I see myself. I'm just a guy in Germany. Where y'all going? I'll tell you where I'll be at five years. Where y'all going? I'm in church. Where y'all headed? He began, to, he began to explain to me something about it. If you ain't got no desire to move from where you are, guess where you're going to stay? When you're complacent to be okay and comfortable with all this desolation and all this without and living in poverty. And I'm not sitting here trying to, trying to preach no get rich quick scheme here. I'm just trying to tell you it's the will of God for his people to be blessed. Amen. I didn't say you had to have four Mercedes, but I mean, come on. You want to give you one, I'll take it. But what I'm saying is there ain't no need in us sitting around begging for bread. Oh, that's Bible. Come on. Never seen God's children yeah. begging for bread in a desolate city. Never seen it. Have you fell on hard times before? Yeah. Absolutely. But there's been many times me and my wife were falling on hard times, and we didn't realize it until somebody told us. <laughs> we were thinking back the other day, me and my wife, we were talking about something. I can't remember what we were talking about. And we were just sitting here thinking, man, we are really blessed. And then she just kind of gave us and said, Lord, I don't know how we made it in certain times that I was mad in the beginning of our marriage. I don't know how we got by. But we didn't know. God was blessing us. Right? Amen. Give unto the Lord. God gives it back. He don't just give it back. He presses it down a little bit. He, he, he starts heaping up while it's pressed. It's compacted. It's tight to the edges. He gives you every bit. He don't want no air to be in your bucket. Man. He gives it to you. This is my You know, get rich quick. I ain't getting nothing out of it. I'm just trying to tell you. Your bucket was designed to be packed in tight, stomped on like a trash can to get all the trash in there. God said, no, 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 you got more room for blessing. Put your foot on it. Stomp it down on it. Put it all over all the way so you can have it for your glory. I'm okay. Now you know if God gave you a cat in heaven. You're going to be the only soul mad in heaven. Kicking dirt and rocks. I can't believe he actually gave me a cat. <laughs> Brother so and so got a mansion. I didn't even like him when I was in church. <laughs> well, glory, hallelujah. So the audience here should hit the organ right here. That's what your desperation. This harmony. Your destination. There's one thing you must know. The fact that when God speaks into a situation, there are those that will accept it. And there are those that will reject it. Come on. Every situation and circumstance has more than one viewpoint. A viewpoint is a place of perception. Depending on where you are in proximity to a situation determines your level of perception. You can't sit there and judge what somebody else has to go through, what destination somebody else has. You can't sit there and judge Abraham because he's walking up the side of a mountain with his kid. Yes, to give sacrifice. Don't be judging so quick. Woo! I think the Lord's got your address. Next week, you're going to be knocking on the door for little Susie. All right. Taking her up to a mountain. So before you judge Abraham, because it looks like he's making a foolish decision, hold up. Amen. Because that was his sacrifice, not yours. Yeah. Wow. And everything God has, the destination that you're headed to in your spirit, don't wait on everybody on your job to be get excited for you. Don't wait on everybody in your home to get excited because of the destination of where you're at. Don't wait on everybody inside of your family reunions to clap when you walk in the room because we're all holier than thou. Yes, sir. Because it ain't going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> Not everybody's on the same page. Amen. Not everybody's going to understand why you're doing what you do. Why don't you ask Peter? Right. Come on, Jesus. Let's just go ahead and call fire out of heaven and kill them all. Don't you get me behind me, say. I think preachers can say hard things to you hurt your feelings. My, my. Jesus called him Satan. It don't get worse than that. There are many viewpoints in life's dilemmas. But there are three major viewpoints I want to talk about in the story we read here this morning. The viewpoint of the king. His viewpoint.
point was very discouraged. The king was looking for God to do something, waiting on God to do something. But when he heard the people were beginning to eat their own children, he became very angry and frustrated with God. To hear God speak into his situation was enough to stop his angry intent to behead Elijah. His impatience was renewed. It has to be one of the most comforting things that when everything around you is going bad, a word from God brings calm to your soul. There's just something about when you're just about to lose your mind and throw it all away. A word from the Lord steps in and calms your soul. Wake up, Jesus! Wake up! We're all about to go in. There's a storm. Wake up! Don't you care? Jesus just kind of rises up. He steps out on the thing and says, Peace be still. Yes, sir. Now, this is my illustrative thinking. I always go overboard with my thinking. I can just see Jesus walking to the edge of the spoon. Peace be still. And then grabs the microphone, drops it, and goes back to bed. <laughs> That's what y'all want, right? <laughs> That's what you want? <laughs> and then all of a sudden, now the storm's gone. Mm. The viewpoint of the king in desperation, but then there's that viewpoint of that king's right hand man. His viewpoint was the despiser. <laughs> King's right hand man was the one who the king leaned on for advice, for counsel, guidance, and wisdom. The one who probably at this time was giving strength and counsel to the king. But this kind of man was not the right man to have at his side when you're waiting on God. Amen. Somebody that's impatient that says, no, we can do it this way. Don't worry about praying. That's going to take too long. Let's go work this out. Because he is the one who doesn't believe. And the one who despises the word when it does come. Disbelief of the promises of God cut men off from the blessings of fulfillment. Amen. Despisers always miss out. Woo. We're here to challenge you this morning. If you're critical of what you know God can do, but you've gotten so tired of waiting that now you've criticized and despised others for getting what you've been praying for, be very careful. Joshua and Caleb made it to their inheritance because they believed they could take the giants. But those that despised the word died in the wilderness. But Joshua and Caleb still had to suffer for 40 years. That's what we don't think about. They wandered in the wilderness. Joshua and Caleb said, we can take it. But the other spies said, no, we can't. So what did Joshua and Caleb have to do? Follow the despisers around because of their death. They suffer because of their unbelief. We don't think about that side of the story. We sit there and think Joshua and Caleb were all blessed. Oh, they were still out there walking in circles. Man, I, I can see Joshua talking to Caleb. You know we done passed this mountain before. <laughs> we ought to be in this city by now. What in the world are we doing out here following all these jokes? They didn't believe a thing. Shh, what? We got to follow. God's going to get God's going to bless us. Hold your peace. And then Joshua and Joshua go up there. Get that blessing up there with Moses here on this and that. Come down there. Walking again, another floor. There's that mountain again. I can see them starting to put marks on the mountain every time they go by. Ten marks. They go around in 40 years and all of a sudden, those doubters and despisers die off. Children are being born. New faith is being grown. Yes, sir. And all of a sudden, God tells Joshua, Hi, get ready. We're fixing to bring down some walls. Right. Fixing to part some more water. Mm -hmm. There'll be some amazing things. Joshua and Caleb got their inheritance. The giants didn't kill those in the wilderness. Amen. They died from their own lack of desperation. Amen. The giants put the fear in them. Right. Then they killed themselves in the wilderness. We sit there so scared of what we feel the enemy can do to our families and our homes. And the devil ain't going to put his hand on you himself. God ain't going to let you. That's right. What we do is we start taking off our armor. We take down our sword and lay it down. Stop praying. Stop worshiping. We start starving. We get weaker and weaker and weaker. And we blame the devil for it all. It's like that story of that man that was walking in the woods one day and the old devil sitting on the stump over there crying in his eyes. He's just crying. He said, devil, what in the world are you crying for? He said, the Pentecostals blame me for everything. I ain't even been messing with them this week. They're blaming me for four families that left and everybody on the back pew. I ain't even been to that side of Savannah. We blame the enemy for everything. Every flat tire, every cold, 
Every sickness, every little thing that comes, the rock hit our windshield, Satan's throwing rocks at us now. Amen. <laughs> I hope it's not really like that. <laughs> God says it'll happen tomorrow, it'll happen. Amen. And I want to be there when it does. Amen. When God speaks, it's specific and without mistake. God has the power to create something out of absolutely nothing. God spoke and stood on nothing when he said, let there be light. Let there be a planet. Let there be ground. Let there be animals. Let there be... And he stood on nothing. God don't need anything, but he wants your faith. He wants your worship. He feasts on that. It don't benefit him. It benefits us. Because without faith, it is impossible. Say it with me. I want that to sit in. Without faith, it is impossible. Without faith, it is impossible. To what? Please. Help. Without faith, it's impossible to make God happy. Come on. God don't need it. God don't need it. God created everything without us before we were even here. But his main goal and desire was fellowship with his creation. And only we will benefit from that. But then there's this last viewpoint as I'm getting closing here, getting near the close, give you a little hope for the buffet. Hallelujah. <laughs> the third viewpoint, we had the king's viewpoint, and then we had the one that leaned on his shoulder, the despiser. The king was discouraged. The one who leaned on was a despiser. But then we had the lepers, which changed the course of everything. The ones that had nothing to lose. The ones that had already become sick and tired of being sick and tired. The lepers had a desperate viewpoint. Four lepers were unaware that God had spoken to the king. Had no inside information at all. Didn't know what was going on because of their condition. Because of their sickness, because of their disease, with leprosy, they were rejected, humiliated, and embarrassed. They were not permitted under normal circumstances to neither go inside the city nor to be in the normal healthy people. They had to keep on their own out of the way. By law, the leper, when you saw one coming down the street, two lane road here, if you saw one coming down the street by law, you were commanded. To go to the other side of the street and shout. Not just go to the other side of the street and just kind of wave at him and say, have a good day. Your job was to shout and say, I'm clean. Whoa, well, I'm clean. You think you got peer pressure. <laughs> Not only would you be avoided, you were shouted out of your uncleanness. It was shouted out of you of what you were going through. And that's what they had to do. Deal with it. The reason they were outside the gate is because they were not permitted to go inside of it. But what Elijah said was to happen, a miracle was needed. You would expect a miracle to come from Elijah that he would stand in the central place of the city and prophesy and pray, calling out to God for deliverance. But that wasn't the way that God was going to send the deliverance. God was sending it down a dusty road of four lepers. Yeah. Amen. I hope you're with me this morning of a desperation I'm trying to stir up inside of you right now. You say you want revival in your spirit. You say you want to see your children back. You say you want healing from that sickness. You say you want to be a part of a great outpouring in your city. But what does your desperation say? We wait for the names of famous people to bring the deliverance and the revival. We wait on those that are highly favored and all over the world that go with third world countries and millions get the Holy Ghost. We wait on them to maybe hopefully pass through our little communities and I ain't degrading that at all. Great men of God. Great people of God. But we sit here and we sit back and we wait on them to bring the deliverance. Wait on them to bring the revivals. Waiting on them to bring the outpouring. But just maybe, just maybe, a revival in this city, an outpouring in this church, a great move of the Holy Ghost is going to come to this church through somebody who is sitting here right now broken, yes, amen. tormented, yes. stripped naked in your spirit from things taken from you. Marriage is on the rocks. Hadn't seen your kids in years. 
Just got a bad report from your doctor. Have no idea if you even want to hang around. And now you're sitting here and God's going, just, just walk toward the city. Just move. And in the process of your movement closer to me, I'm going to heal and bless every step you take. And deliverance is going to come not only to you, but it's going to come to the whole city that you stood in front of. You're going to grab a hold of something that you're going to take back with you to those around you who's hurting too. I don't know who all's hurting. I didn't get a list from Pastor when he said, All right, I need you to come preach for me this Sunday. Here's a list of all those knuckleheads and all those sick and all that. No, I didn't get nothing like that, obviously. He, just come and minister and let God speak to me. And I really feel, I don't know. I have no idea. I don't need you to come up here and tell me every bad thing you're going through. You might water down my faith. I might get depressed by the time you get through. Everybody stand in this place right now. I feel the Holy Ghost for you. Keep up. Ma'am, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know how long you've been praying. I don't know how many times have you been in there by yourself, just hearing your own voice, wondering if God can hear you. Crying your eyes out. Nobody even knows you've been crying. I have no idea how long you've been dealing with that, how long you've been praying for your lost spouse, how long you've been dealing with this alcoholism, how long you've been having to deal with the drugs coming in your home through your children. I have no idea how long it's been since you've spoken to them. Sir, I don't know what you deal with on your job. I don't know what the compromises that are coming up in your spirit, the questions you're starting to have about God, His faithfulness and His goodness. Sir, I don't know. Grandmama, Grandpapa, I'm telling you right now, the grandkids are going to come back. I'm telling you right now, God's drawing them back. This generation is going to be strong. This generation is rising up stronger than we've ever seen before. Yeah, we're seeing a lot of stuff going on in our world around us. But for our young people to stay in church and endure in that kind of circumstance lets us know they got more than we think they got. Yes, amen. We got to give them more credit. These young people, they can do it. They can pray those prayers. They can bring people to church. We just got to get them in the city. Walk with them. Encourage them. And once we get there, tell them, get desperate. Tell them, say, baby, you want to stay here till you die? You want to be right here till you die? You want to water down and be desolate and starve to death? Or you want to rise up with me and get desperate and go take this city? Come on. I don't know what restaurant you're going to eat at when we leave this place right now, but I can tell you right now, that waitress will want the Holy Ghost if you probably told them about it. Amen. I ain't trying to make you feel guilty. We've all been there. There might be somebody right now at lunch that you're going to talk to, and they're going to be back in church either next, this midweek or this coming up Sunday. That's what revival is. It's when you get stirred up. It's when you get desperate. That's revival. It's not when people come in the doors. Revival is when you get desperate. Outpouring is when people come in the doors. And it only happens when you get desperate. Because when you get desperate, you go out and get them. Bring them back in. And I don't know anything. I'm not trying to bash you over the head. There's probably a great outreach going. I, I, I believe that with all my heart. But never let it be enough for you. Every soul matters. Because I don't know how much that church was praying before I came that day. I have no idea what kind of prayers they were praying. How much fasting was taking place at that time. I heard about it later. But when I came in there, they were prepared. They'd been fasting and praying for an outpouring. And then somebody invited me to come to church. And I wandered up in there just looking around. Didn't know nothing for nothing. And then all of a sudden, Pastor gave that altar call. I came down and I began to, I began to benefit from all the fruit that that church was growing. Uh, desperation is going to determine your destination if you like where you are and you're complacent then that's probably where you're going to stay but if you're getting sick and tired of not having the prayer life that you always wanted praying like you used to when you first got in church but it's been a long time since you've spoken in the spirit you've gotten sick and tired of just going through the motions I'm here to challenge you here this morning it's time for you to get desperate in your prayer Man's extremity is God's opportunity of magnifying his own power. His time to appear for his people is when their strength is gone. He does not do this through a name or a long line of pedigree. He does what he does despite who you are through your faith. Do you consider yourself better than a leper? Spurgeon once said this once. He said, nothing more. I'm nothing more than one beggar showing another beggar where the bread is. I think today that God is looking for a handful of beggars or lepers to go into the enemy's camp 
and bring back what the devil stolen from you for years. It's time this morning, as this altar call is being opened, as this altar is being opened, it's time for you to get desperate about your home. It's time for you to get desperate about your children. It's time for you to get desperate about your church. It's time for you to get desperate about the ministries in your church, whatever you're involved in. It's time for you to get desperate on your job. And it's time for you to reach those around you. Get desperate for your children's ministry. Get desperate for your youth ministry. Get desperate for your music ministry. Because it's prepared in our mind for God to save somebody. This is more than what the church just does to go through the motions. It prepares an atmosphere for somebody to get the Holy Ghost. It's not about us. It's all about Him. When your desperation determines your destination, come on. Now is not a moment to be silent as the world around you dies. And all we're worried about is just making it through the gates. Now is not a moment to come down and bury your head in the sand and act like all of your problems are going to go away. Now is the moment to cry out for your city. Cry out for your children. Cry out for your pastor. Cry out for the pastor's family. Cry out for the ministries. Stop letting the devil have his way. Come on, please. 
this morning that's scared you to death. God is challenging you this morning right now that causes every reasoning ability in your mind to be put aside. You just don't understand how God can do it. You don't understand if God's going to be able to do it. And you question God's theories and God's ways and God's tactics. But I want to encourage you this morning. God told Noah, go do something different. I'm about to bring a very deadly situation on you. And in your desperation, you're going to build a boat. He told Moses, if you get desperate and leave Egypt, I'm going to bring you to a Red Sea. And your desperation is going to cause you to walk right through it. Because when God brings you to it, He's bringing you to it that He may bring you through it. God told Jonah, do something different. Go preach to Nineveh. Told Joshua, do something different. Walk. Walk around the walls. Walk around the walls. Pray and worship. Worship on that last lap. And watch your walls start falling. Get desperate in your pipe. Get desperate in your walls. Anything can happen. Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Like I said, if you're praying, keep praying. It's fine with us, Lord. 